Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. So today I thought I would give you guys a walkthrough of my system, of the piping layout in my system. And I did something similar in the mechanical room videos, but I've had a bunch of you ask me about, you know, what what drew me to think of combining both uh, all of my radiant heat and my snowmelt along with all of my domestic and you know the idea behind all of that instead of having separate systems uh, so I thought I would just make a, a video here and, and show you guys plus I've had a lot of questions on the piping you know where's your primary loop what is the secondary loop um, you know where are your pumps all that sort of stuff so I thought it would be easier just to uh, to make a video and try to answer those questions so if you're following along in the playlist, um, by this point in time that I drew this, I had already designed my loop layouts. Uh, we had already removed the old driveway and installed all of the pecs and poured the new heated driveway. And then I used the Upener Snowmelt Design Manual, one of many tools that I used, but uh, I used that manual, which I did a video on, I can link to it above to, to show you how to do that, to determine what size equipment I was going to need. That's just for the snow melt. So now I'm to the point where I haven't really purchased equipment yet and started to buy all of this. Um, you know, as of today, it's all built and installed and it works great, but I'm kind of going back now and explaining a lot of this. So again, if you're new to the channel, uh, the playlist is where you really, if, if you want to start at the beginning and walk through exactly what I did uh, as I'm uploading some of these older videos, they'll be in order on the playlist. Those of you that have been around and, and subscribed to me for a while, uh, you know, the these are going to be older, took place a while ago, but still you might find them useful. So anyway, in the in the last video, I determined after doing all of the math that I was right on the border for one tankless unit. As far as the snow melt goes, I think the uh, you know the output taking the efficiency into consideration on one of these units was like 183, 185,000 BTUs. My snow melt requirement on a design day was 175,000, uh, and I you know I think that was with uh, zero degrees outside, five degree wind, and uh, six inches on center and all that, which you can go back and, and check out in those videos. So I ultimately made the decision to go with two units, and that way I've got redundancy, I've got a backup if one goes down, and really they talk to each other, so so they, they do kind of act as one unit. So what I did was I sat down, I drew my two Takagi TH3DV natural gas units, and I started to kind of figure out exactly how I wanted to pipe them. Now in real life, if you go back and watch the mechanical room videos, um, you'll see how I really piped this, but it does follow this general layout. It might not look exactly like this. This was just on paper so I could flow through and figure things out. But basically coming out of each heater, I'll, I'll start at each heater. We come out with one inch copper and I go right into one inch right at the right at the heater. And then I have um, basically uh, three quarter inch hose valves or you know whatever you want to call them, hose, fill bibs, whatever, on both the cold and the hot, followed by shutoff valves. And that lets me shut off both the cold and the hot and service the units. So I can hook up my pump and my hoses to these and flush the units out with vinegar once a year. I can also shut these off and change the little inlet filter that, that commonly gets uh, plugged up with sediment and stuff on, on the inlet of these Takagi's. And I have other videos, uh, if I haven't put them up yet, they're coming soon on that and what happens there. So anyway, um, I came out on all four of them, went into three quarter inch hose, shut off bibs here, and then into ball valves to shut everything off. Okay, after that, still in one inch on each unit, we have pressure temperature and pressure relief valves on the hot of both units. Okay, and then after on the hot output, after we pick up the second unit, this is a one by one by one and a half inch T. Okay, then the primary loop, this is the primary loop here, steps up to inch and a half. Okay, and if you'll notice, and I'll, I'll talk about this too in a minute, 
my hot is kind of going out to the right, my cold is coming in from the left, and these are not piped where both the hot and the cold go into one unit and then hot and cold go into the next unit. Basically, the, the furthest unit supplying hot is also the first unit to get the cold. Okay, so that's called reverse return piping. And basically, the, the return is, is, you know, the return, the cold water is reversed from the supply. So what it does is it ensures an equal flow through both units at the same time. And it works. So anyway, after the output of both units in one inch, we hit this inch and a half T. We come across and there is a temperature and pressure gauge I put in there just to kind of keep an eye on, on what's going on with the system. And then on one of the first elbows here, there is another inch and a half by inch and a half by one inch T. And this is where the hot water will go and supply my 20 gallon stainless steel hot water tank. Okay, now this, this is just an HTP stainless steel. It's an electric tank. However, I removed the electric heating element from it and I removed the thermostat from the unit. Okay, and I put my own uh, units in there. I actually used the hole for the heating element is where I put the aquastat well for the probe that reads the temperature of the tank and then therefore turns on this Taco 0013 pump when the tank drops below a certain degree. Now, the thermostat that came with the tank basically just sat, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, thermostats on these these electric style tanks, but they um, basically just sets up against the stainless steel tank and reads the temperature and, and you really only have a one degree uh, level of differential there. So you set the set point, you set the temperature, and then when it drops below that, it comes on. And when it gets above that, it turns off. And I was afraid that that was going to be short cycling this pump, which then in turn would short cycle these heaters to death. You know, I wanted more adjustability. So I went with one of those Ranco 120 volt digital aquastats, and that's mounted to the wall over here behind it. And again, I have other videos I can link above where I explain all that. But that allows me to not only set the the point on the the tank, you know, how hot I want the tank to get, but also set a differential. So in other words, you know, turn off this pump when it reaches 131, I think I have it set for. Turn it on when it gets below 125, it's a six degree differential. And I can dial all that in uh, by the degree with the aquastat. So the trick here on the primary loop is that the T coming to the hot water tank is before the flat plate heat exchanger. And what that pretty much guarantees is no matter what is going on on the hydronic heating side of things over here, okay, no matter how many BTUs and how much heat the heating and the driveway is stealing from the primary loop, the hot water always comes first. So essentially, even with the snow melt on, if if it was, you know, a super cold day and, and we had an, an ice cold frozen zero degree slab we were trying to bring up and we were using more capacity than these could put out, we would still have domestic hot water first. Okay, because it's it's going to get the hottest water right off the tee first before it has a chance to go through the heat exchanger and have all of its heat stolen, so to speak. Okay, so we'll get into the... Uh, to the domestic side of plumbing. I'm going to stick with the primary loop right now. So we come, we make a, a 90 and we come down a little bit and then we turn and this, and this is pretty true in reality. This is kind of how I piped it. We go through a one way check valve and then here there's an inch and a half, inch and a half by one inch T that allows my cold water into the system. Okay. So as we're pulling hot water from the tank, which goes through a three way mixing valve, well, you need cold water coming into the tank from somewhere, and that comes in from down here. Okay, and, and I'll explain all this in a bit, but this is where that enters the primary loop to be heated by the heaters. Okay, same thing here. I put a shutoff in here, and then a T with a three-quarter inch hose bib fitting on it, and same thing down here and the output. And what that does is it allows me to shut off the primary loop here and here and flush the domestic side of the 100 plate flat plate heat exchanger. Okay, so 
I believe these are one inch or inch and a quarter. I think there might be inch and a quarter ports on here. So I did adapt from inch and a quarter down to, or from inch and a half down to inch and a quarter. I don't think they were inch and a half, but um, anyway, the hot water, whatever's left or all of it, if the, if the tank isn't calling, 140 degree water or whatever your heaters are set point comes down and enters into the domestic hot water side of the flat plate heat exchanger. Okay, now if nothing on the radiant side or snow melt side over here is calling, then it just passes through, no big deal, comes out, you know, it shows blue here as being cold, but it's pretty much still hot. I'm talking like summer months when none of this is on. It's it's still pretty warm. Um, comes through another temperature and pressure valve. Uh, I have a, a spiral vent. This is an inch and a half spiral vent air separator with a portable expansion tank because you need an expansion tank on the on the primary loop to take up the fluid as it expands, as the hot water expands, okay? And then it comes up and goes through my primary loop pump and then back into the heaters. Now, normally, like in the summer, when nothing is calling here, this pump is just off and the water, you know, the the water as it's being circulated through the tank just flows right through that pump. No restriction, no problem. Uh, it doesn't really slow it down or anything. I'm still getting full flow, uh, no no issues there. So, okay, so so this is basically my primary loop right here. Uh, it comes out hot, goes through the flat plate, turns cold, comes back into the heaters, gets heated again. And if there's no domestic on, on this side of things calling, none of this over here is calling, this just keeps going around and around and around, heating, losing heat to the to the heating side or the snow melt, and then going back up and getting reheated and, and just doing that, okay? Now, on the hydronic side of the flat plate heat exchanger, this is all 40% mixture of propylene glycol and distilled water. Okay, and propylene is the pink stuff, it's not the green stuff. So on the secondary loop, or the secondary side of the heat exchanger, we come out, we have my, again, pressure relief valve. This, I believe, is a 30 pound, whereas these are like, hmm, I want to say they're 100, 100 pound uh, pressure relief valves, so very different. The, the heating side is very low pressure. Okay, I think it's at 14 PSI where it's been since I filled it. So, um, again, some purge and fill valves here for when you're when you're filling the system. Uh, shut off. Another inch and a half spiral vent, and this is where I have my radiant. It's the red tank, and it's and it's much bigger than this one. I think this is a 10 gallon, where this is maybe a one and a half. I forget the sizes, but. Uh, this is where my big red, if you've seen it in the other videos, um, expansion tank comes off of. We go through another fill and purge, temperature and pressure, and then we go into my zones. Okay, now for each zone, the staple up for all of the house that's underneath the master bedroom, the bathrooms, the kitchen, the entryway, all the, the radiant heat for the house, it's all one inch comes up through a one-way check valve so once it gets through here it can't go backwards okay and then there's a bypass valve here this is a Belimo three-way it's not a mixing valve it's a bypass valve and I'll explain that so normally your hot water would just come up go through my Takeo VT2218 Delta T pump which I can talk about those go through my zone out to the radiant come back on the cold side and if the zone, since I'm using all continuous circulation, and I did videos on, on that and explained that, I'll put link to those above, when the zone does not need any more heat, this valve is in bypass. So this fluid will just keep circulating through the zone, through the zone, through the zone, okay? So then what happens is as this zone needs more heat, which is determined by this probe which is attached to the return plumbing side return piping side so it's sensing the return temperature as it comes back before it gets to the three-way valve as this zone needs more heat the aquastat again it's another ranco digital aquastat with um, 
pretty much infinite adjustability as far as differential and temperature and they're great units uh, this will then trigger and it will do two things number one it will tell this three-way bypass valve that it can now open and instead of bypassing and and making the the zone fluid or the glycol go back around it'll start to let it come down through the return piping go through the flat plate heat exchanger and pick up more heat okay and at the same time it's also sending a signal now here i have these wired where all three wires would go right to the to the pump however in real life they really come to a relay box that sits over here and that aquastat is also telling this primary pump to turn on okay and what that does is once this primary pump turns on it starts generating flow in the primary loop and these Takagi tankless units see that flow so they automatically fire up and start producing hot water now a neat thing that that kind of happens here is you know as it, it takes a good I don't know I haven't really timed it 30 40 seconds for this Belimo bypass valve to slowly start to open and let this this fluid in so once this primary loop pump fires you know it doesn't take long before this 140 degree water coming out makes it through here and is coming back in so the tankless units really start to slow and step way down in modulation almost all the way kind of to the bottom they're in like stage one they're using very little btus and sometimes one of them will even turn off because if you don't have enough demand to keep both units on it's 15,000 btu minimum per unit and if you're using less than 30,000 btus you know for the system one of these will turn off and just one of them will handle the load so then as as this bypass valve slowly starts to open this cooler glycol comes back goes through the flat plate and you'll start to see these cooler temperatures entering the unit and then the units can slowly increase until they they get to where they're happy and right where they want to be okay and that's pretty much the same concept for all three of these zones it's the same thing for the slabs it's the same thing for the snow melt uh the only big difference here number one the snow melt has a, a bigger piping size because i required a little bit more uh flow and you know that that ice cold glycol coming back can be somewhat difficult from the driveway to push so i went with a bigger pump here and as far as the house stuff i use these these taco uh, viridian vt2218 delta t pumps so what happens there is you know as this valve opens and the glycol is going back through the flat plate heat exchanger and picking up heat now it's coming in through this supply at 100 110 120 125 usually if the snow melt or nothing's on this will see 120 to 125 degrees and because there's more than a in delta t mode i have it set to a 10 degree differential so when the supply starts getting more than 10 degrees warmer than the return this pump starts to speed up on its own and the pump will slowly ramp up from like three gallons a minute to i want to say it gets up to like eight gallons a minute where it really starts to move this glycol through this loop and pump the heat out okay but then as as the zone slowly warms and warms and and the return temperature the return glycol coming back from the zone keeps increasing and increasing eventually it'll get to the set point the aquastat will be satisfied the aquastat will close the bypass valve which only takes like 10 seconds to close it it's spring loaded and it will turn off the primary loop pump and then you'll slowly start this will just keep circulating this taco pump will slowly start to see that the return is coming to equal the supply because it's the same loop it's a closed loop now and once it evens out this pump will slow way down to where it barely uses it's still pumping it's pumping like three gallons a minute but it's using basically you know very very little electricity so it, it becomes very efficient um, it's a good way to to leave it on and let it continuously circulate and that's the whole idea behind this that's the whole concept is continuous circulation i i did a video on that which i can uh, link above but 
the idea is that as the house, the garage, the rooms lose heat to the outside, the return coming back is going to be colder. And the colder it is outside, the more heat is going to be lost by the envelope of the building, the garage, whatever, and the floors and everything else in the room are going to see that. So the colder it gets, the more this will cycle because it's losing heat quicker. But really, there's no thermostat that you know needs to, to kick on. This, this, this aquastat is the thermostat, and it's all done automatically based on return glycol temperature. And so far, it works very, very well. Um, so with regards to the snowmelt, same concept. Uh, now, I do have powering. I didn't draw it in here, but powering this these aquastats the top of these two switches is 120 volts all the time and the bottom is 120 volts that's switched on two smart switches so one of them is for the radiant and when that radiant switch is on both of these are powered everything as far as radiant is powered and this is the snow melt so when that snow melt switch is on this outlet is powered and that provides power here so as long as, as the radiant or snow melt is on, these pumps run 24-7. Okay, now the Taco 0013, that's not as efficient, obviously, at these. That just goes the whole time it's on, which, you know, yes, it's, it's a big pump and it's using a lot of electricity, but I am really only have it on while I'm melting snow and then I turn it off. It's not like the radiant where it's staying on all winter. Okay, this is very, very process-driven on the snow melt versus, you know, this is more comfort. It's, it's maintaining where this has got one goal in mind, which is to clear that driveway and then it gets shut off. So same concept though. Um, the, the snow melt switch is, is turned on. The pump turns on, starts circulating that cold glycol back. Once the cold glycol gets below whatever I have it set to, opens up the three-way valve, comes through, picks up heat, turns on the, the primary loop starts to gain heat from the heaters and i've done startup videos um again go to the playlist look for like the valentine's day 21 president's day 21 startup videos and you can see how initially you'll get a cold you know you'll get 30 degree glycol coming back from the driveway and you know the the flat plate can only get enough it, it can only get so much and it is a big flat plate heat exchanger it's a hundred plate Okay, but even then, it's only big enough with 140 degrees on the primary side to get this supply up to 80 initially. So it can only really get a 50 degree rise until things start warming up. Then it'll slowly come up to 90 and eventually 100. And eventually, once once the slab is up to temperature and everything's good, I'll usually see an output to the driveway of around 100, 105 degrees, which, again, if you go back and watch the uh, the opener video there where I sized everything, you know, the, they said my supply temperature would be 102 degrees, and, and they're pretty close. Uh, it's, it's almost right on. So that's about what I get. I don't mind that it can't it can't get right off the bat you know, that 60 or 70 um, degree rise because it's so if to me, it's okay that it takes a couple of hours for that, you know, 80 degree supply to make it up to a hundred. It, it just, it hits the slab a little bit less hard. I mean, really, and there's articles out there if you Google it, but I think in order to really, I've had some comments about, are you worried about shocking your slab and all of that? And, you know, really, to, to shock a slab, a concrete slab, hard enough to do thermal, like to thermally shock it hard enough to do damage to it, to crack it. I mean, you would need a system and piping much, much larger than what I have here. Okay, the, these two tankless water heaters, yes, they can modulate from 15,000 all the way up to 400,000, but even 400,000 BTUs, you're still only pushing it through five eighths inch packs at the bottom of a five inch thick slab you can't get enough heat out there fast enough at these temperatures to really bring that that slab up fast enough to to do any damage to it now if you had a big boiler you know you you had a half a million a million btu boiler and you had three quarter inch or one inch pecs out there where you could really get some good transfer then yeah you might want to slowly think about you know slowly bringing it up but 
I've run this thing all last winter, well, all February, March of 2021, as you can see from all my videos, and I haven't noticed anything on the slab as far as any cracks that weren't there since the day it was poured. I mean, concrete's going to crack. It's 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 a part of concrete, but as far as any damage from running the snow melt, I haven't noticed anything at all. Um, so anyway, yeah, as far as the return, uh, again, just, just some purge and fill valves. I use these when, when purging and filling the system. Um, these one-way check valves, like I talked about, I only put those there so that when it is in bypass, there's no chance that it, that it can backfeed any sort of way through the primary loop. Um, it really wouldn't anyway, cause this valve is closed, but still that just allows it to, you know, it can't go back. So it's gotta, it's just gotta circulate in the zone. So the return side's pretty easy. It, it basically just comes all the way back through another fill and purge and it goes back through the flat plate heat exchanger and starts the process all over again. Now I mentioned earlier about how, you know, here it's shown where all these wires go to this Taco. Well, that wouldn't necessarily work that way because if any one of these zones called, if all the hots were tied together here at the pump, what's going to happen is the electrical, the, the 120 volts is, is basically going to backfeed into the aquastats, which really wouldn't hurt them, but it's going to turn on all these three-way valves. So anytime one zone called, they were all going to open, and then you're dumping heat into rooms or into the driveway where you don't really need it. So you're either going to overheat these rooms because they don't need heat. And, you know, you've got one aquastat calling and the other one's opening because they're all tied together. So you're going to smoke people out of these rooms or you're going to, you're basically putting uh, heat out to the driveway when it's not necessary. It's not snowing, you know, like it's November and it's just cold, but it's not snowing. So there's no sense in dumping BTUs out there. So what I did there, and I did a whole electrical system overview video. You guys can go check that out Is I ran all these through relays, which isolate each zone. Okay. Also what the relays do is they make it so that basically these aquastats don't see the load of this pump. This pump is all run through a relay and fed separately so that when these kick on, they're just activating a relay, which then sends the load of the pump, uh, sends the load to this pump. So it, it saves, I mean, these aquastats are pretty, they're pretty, uh, beefy. They're pretty, you know, duty rated. I don't think it would hurt them. I mean, the tank, the, uh, the hot water tank, I'm running that one direct. I have not put that one through a relay yet, although it is on my to-do list. Uh, but anyway, I haven't noticed any, any wear on them at all or anything like that. So, so that's kind of the primary secondary loop side. Uh, I can talk real quick here about the domestic side of things. So basically one of the whole reasons behind this was we've had a tankless hot water heater for years, for 10, 15 years now, pretty much since we bought the house. And they're great. You get endless hot water. They work well. However, they do have their drawbacks. And, you know, one of them is that it takes a long time for the unit to, at least the Bosch unit that we had. Now, mine was a 2400 natural gas. I think it was a 2400E. We bought it in like 2006, 2007. And so the flow rates now in order to activate these things like these Takagi's are much lower than what this Bosch was. But what we were seeing is, okay, you're upstairs in the kitchen or in the bathroom and you turn the faucet on and you've got to wait. You've got to wait for this unit. You're getting water right away. You know, you're getting hot water that's flowing through the tankless, but that tankless has to see the flow. It has to ignite. It has to start bringing that water up to temperature, and then it has to get the water all the way through the pipes and out to the house to get to you. And it took a good minute, minute and a half before you got hot water. And honestly, nine times out of 10, if you're just rinsing dishes or washing your hands, your need for hot water was already over before the hot water even got there. So you basically just fired this tankless for no reason. Um, same thing, what we discovered with the dishwasher after a certain period of time was, yes, it was connected to the hot water line, but our Bosch dishwasher at the time only pulled like, I want to say, you know, 0.3 gallons a minute or something like that. And the, and the fire rate for our old Bosch was like 0.5, something like that. So, so the, the flow 
was lower than what was necessary to ignite the unit. So basically, the dishwasher didn't have enough flow to even turn on the hot water. So you'd never get hot water to the dishwasher. Okay, so, you know, there, there were all these issues. And again, it worked great if, if as long as you didn't mind waiting and bringing the, the hot water up to temperature. You did have endless hot water. They, it did work well for all those years. But in doing this whole project, I decided that I wanted to fix some of these issues. And I'd found some articles online and went, you know, read some forum postings. And uh, one of them was to just add a tank add a tank to your tankless unit and then just use a pump to circulate the tank. So when the tank drops below a certain temp temperature, like I mentioned before, it turns this pump on, which then pumps water either coming in from the cold water line if a faucet's open or if no faucets are open and this tank drops, all it does is pull from this same port on the bottom through the pump into the primary loop, heats it up, and comes back into the tank. So it circulates the tank. And that's why this check, this one-way check valve is here is so that as this water, either from the tank or from the street, enters, it can't go back. It has to go through the flat plate and through the heaters and then back into the tank. Okay, so um, that's kind of the idea behind this. And so far, it works very well. I have an Aquastat that, that runs this tank. And as this tank needs heat, the... It, it'll kick off this Taco and it'll fire the units and just replenish the tank. It takes three minutes for these two Takagis at 140. It takes three minutes for them to completely replenish the 20 gallon tank. Okay. Um, and, and I've, I have videos if I haven't uploaded them yet, they're coming of, of all of that. I show you a whole cycle and I show you how many BTUs it uses. And you would think that, Oh my gosh, you know, you're you're short cycling these things. Really? If if there's no draw on the hot water side during the day, this tank, because it's a very well insulated HTP stainless steel tank, this thing will sit for two hours, three hours before it needs to fire and run for three minutes to bring it back up to 131 degrees. Okay, so if there's no load on it, it's extremely efficient. It's very well insulated, it just sits here. And does its thing okay now the other thing i did to solve the problem of having to wait for the hot water was i wanted to incorporate some sort of a recirculation loop so what i did was coming off the side of the tank i is my hot water output uh goes through a, a one-way check valve and goes into a three-way mixing valve and this is set at 120 degrees uh, i have kids here you know i don't want to burn them i don't want them seeing 140 degree water because that that can burn so 120 is pretty safe so i have that set right at 120 and then only 120 degrees goes out to the house so from there it can do one of two things it can either turn and go up to the mana block and out to the fixture that's calling or it can turn and go back through a taco 006 just a much smaller recirculation pump and back and into the tank and again, I have another Aquastat that just sits on that recirc line right up pretty much where it meets the hot. And as this temperature right here of the water in here drops below, forget what I have it at, 110, 115. At any time this drops below 115, this Aquastat turns on this little pump. This pump runs for 30 seconds and brings the temperature of this water inside this pipe right back up to 100 and I want to say I have it set at 115 okay so or 110 something like that so it pretty much always guarantees that you have hot water right to the bottom of this mana block at all times now I thought well that can't be super efficient because I don't want this thing doing that all night when we don't need hot water or if we are gone during the day if we're all at work and school I don't need this thing doing that so I put this on a smart outlet or a smart switch, and then I can set schedules in my smart things app that says, okay, only activate the recirc pump, you know, Monday through Friday between 5.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. Because I know that by 8 a.m. we're usually all gone and then turn it on on these days at four and turn it off at 10 p.m. at bedtime. 
So during the off times when you know that you don't really need hot water because nobody's using it, we're either sleeping or not here, then this is off and it, it doesn't recirc. So again, like I said, during the day when we're all at work or school, this, this tank will just sit here. There's no draw on it. So it'll just sit here for two or three hours before it loses five degrees, six degrees. I think I have the differential set at. So um, I have it set right now at 125 or comes on at 125 with a six degree differential. So once this thing drops below 125, it comes on and brings the tank back up to 131. Okay, so what happens when somebody's taking a shower or turning on and off? Well, they're two different things. If you're taking a shower, eventually most showers are long enough to where you're going to you're going to kick off the tank and that's no problem. So at first the tank will drop below 125 because you're pulling hot water from the tank for the shower, right? This pump will kick on. You don't notice it at all. In the shower because this is all under street pressure from the meter okay so what happens is not only now are you pulling from the tank but if you have say a shower head that's putting out two gallons a minute okay like through out through the mixing valve and out well you need to be bringing in that same two gallons a minute in from the street so that comes in and it can do one of two things. It could go into the tank, but if the pump's on, usually, or you know, that that you will see this cooler 60 degree street, you know, water from the road mixing with 125 degree water coming in from the tank and going through the, the Taco pump and into the primary loop to be heated. So does it matter to any of this down here? No, absolutely not. Does it matter to the heaters? Only that they now, instead of seeing 125 degrees coming back when they're on at their lowest point, they will mix with this 60 degree water and this might drop down to 110, 105. So the heaters will ramp up their BTUs in order to still maintain that 140 degree output. Okay, and they do that all automatically. So it does use more BTUs when you're replace you know when you have cold water coming in versus just circulating the tank but that's okay i mean it'd be no difference as if you weren't circulating the tank and you were just running 60 degree street water through a tankless hot water heater all the time it's got to bring that 60 degree water up to 140 so you'd be doing it anyways right so so that's how that works as far as could i ever could i ever um outrun the system um this Taco 0013 right now can put just under four gallons a minute through each tankless. So I can pump, you know, eight gallons a minute through this tank. And it makes sense because when this is on, you know, like I said, it only takes three minutes and it's off. So, you know, you're you're right there as far as, um, you know, eight times three is 24. That's 24 gallons in three minutes is what this thing could recirc. And that's only a 20 gallon tank. So that, that that's exactly what it does. So I guess, yes, if I ever had a draw in the house that was larger than eight gallons per minute, I could most likely over, you know, outrun what this pump can pump. But because of the way I piped it, and I've never tried this because I've never had a demand that high in the house. I mean, you're talking two or three showers, maybe the dishwasher, the washing machine, all going at once. Eight gallons a minute, you're moving quite a bit of water, okay? And I haven't experienced that yet here. So because of the way I pipe this, I'm still thinking a, mo a majority of your up to eight gallons a minute would be going through the pump and into the heaters, now, if say you're at nine or 10 gallons a minute you're using, well, now you're going to have eight going through the pump because that's all that it can push through the Takagi's. The other two is going to be slowly filling the tank, but you still at the same time have eight to nine gallons a minute or whatever, 10 coming into the tank that's hot. And because I, I pulled the hot water supply off the top half of the tank, I don't think you would ever see cold cold water um like street 
water, it might start to get warm on you after time, you know, like, I mean, and again, you're, you'd have to be drawn that big of a draw for quite a period of time in order to, to get this to, you know, to, in order to realize this situation. And honestly, I just don't ever see it happening. Not with these two units and everything. It, it, this is, would be quite a demand, but I don't think it would get cold, cold. It might start to get warm because you're still pumping in 140 degree water through a one inch pipe at the same, you know, at more of a rate than what you would be pumping in cold. So if you got a 10 gallon a minute draw, this can handle eight and you've got two, the other two are coming from the street here and the pumps taking the other eight. You see what I mean? Like, I think you would still get maybe even 120 degree water uh, going out. I don't know, but again, that, that was my thought on it. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how this whole system that I designed worked. Um, as far as like that was taking a shower, as far as like washing your hands and just rinsing dishes and that sort of stuff. Well, the beautiful thing now is before with the old tankless, every time you turned on a tap, the hot water heater, the tank was hot water heater, saw the flow, would it ignite, fire, run, and if it was only a quick 10 second rinsing of a dish, it would turn off, do its cool down. Every single time you open any hot water tap in the house, that tankless unit was cycling. And whether it was for 30 seconds or for 30 minutes, it was cycling. The beautiful thing now is no matter if it's a two second, you turn the hot water on and off for two seconds, doesn't matter. You're only taking hot water from the tank. So the tankless units never see that flow. They won't fire. The only time these tankless units will ever fire is if this pump is on. Okay, so otherwise, all of your hot water is coming from this tank. So hand washing, dishwashing even, as long as you, you're not bringing the temperature of this tank down below 125, it, it won't fire. So the other thing that I don't have drawn on here is off of this T right here, I also ran a hot water line out to my furnace because we have an April Air 700 whole house humidifier on the furnace, which keeps the, the house from getting too dry in the winter. And that they recommend up to 140 degree water. So what I did was I tapped off the hot output before it got to the three-way mixing valve so that I can send full 140 degree water out to the furnace and then it comes back in and it ties it ties in you know anywhere in this recirculation line here it ties right back in with a one-way check valve and it just recirculates the tank so as long as the, the furnace is on and it's calling you're pulling 140 degree water from the tank and within 30 seconds that loop has come. I mean, it's not using any of that heat. So you get 130 coming back, you know, sure. Over a few minutes, it'll, it'll deplete this enough to fire the tankless units. But really, I mean, if it's only on for five minutes, you know, you, you might even not set this down six degrees to where it even notices it. So, and then I have 140 degree water right at the humidifier at the furnace as long as it's running. And I did a whole nother video. I know I haven't uploaded that one yet, but it's coming on how I wired that. I didn't use an Aquastat. I did use some relays. And as long as the furnace is activating the humidifier, then I have another Taco 006 stainless steel pump that turns on and, and recirks that line. And it works great. It, it works great. So yeah, that was kind of how I came to integrate my snowmelt with my radiant with my domestic into one big system some people might take a step back and be like wow you know that's super complicated and it's ridiculous you should have just taken one heater and made it for the radiant and the snowmelt and the other one for your domestic or just done a tank just gone back to a tank and yes they're they're right i could have done that but par another part of my argument was then all summer i have a tankless unit that's just sitting here going stagnant. It's not getting used. Nothing's getting fired and cycled. And, you know, I know sometimes with stuff, when it sits, it's when you start to get problems with it, you know? So this way, these things are exercised even in the summer, all summer long, these tankless units are fired to do my domestic. They're just fired more in the winter to handle this stuff. 
But anyway, so far we've been really happy. We can open a tap on the second floor of our house and it takes 10 seconds. When the when this recirc loop is, is on and this point right here is hot, it takes like eight to 10 seconds to get 120 degree water at the furthest fixture away. So no more minute and a half of standing there waiting. I mean, you, you pretty much get instant hot water wherever you are. Um, the other thing I didn't draw on here is another thing I did, and it's not really related to the hot water system here, but I, I did install years ago one of these mana blocks, and they have a cold inlet port on the top and then a cold on the bottom, and the water flows right through it. And what I found was if you cap off one end, like so if you cap this off, now the hot really only has one spot to enter on one end. So the hot, you really can't do this. But the cold, what we found was happening is if this port up here was capped off, this cold would come in and whatever fixture was closest to the incoming cold piping would get the flow first. So if your shower was down here at the end and somebody flushed a toilet, this toilet's going to get the water and you're going to see that pressure drop in your shower. Okay, so what I did there, and again, I didn't really draw it here, was in my basement, from the meter, I have a T and there's a loop that goes all the way around the utility room. And you'll see that in my, in my videos. Um, that basically provides a loop, a pressure balancing loop, so that both the top and the bottom are getting equal pressure and flow from the meter. So then it doesn't matter where in line your fixture is pulling from, they're both getting equal pressure. So if, if somebody if you know if the shower's running and somebody flushes the toilet down here, it doesn't matter because the shower is also getting flow and pressure from the top here, which just tees off the meter. Um, it's over here off the page. I didn't draw it in. But you know, just another thing that I did during this whole process to fix things after 10 or 15 years of living here that we've noticed that we wanted to fix. And so far, we couldn't be happier. I couldn't be happier with this setup. Um, these tankless units are, in my opinion, they're cheap. If one of them does fail, I shut it off. I get parts. I replace the whole thing. I mean, I could probably replace one of these tankless units in 10 minutes with with all of the, uh, the unions and everything I used. It really didn't take long. So... Anyway, uh, yeah, this is this is one's getting a little long, but um, yeah, after this one, I'm gonna start uploading a lot of the old installation videos of when I put these these heaters on the wall, when I mounted them, started piping them. So I've got a ton of video of the installation process, even though it's kind of after the fact now. They've been up and running. You guys have seen the mechanical room and the and the you know the driveway melting, but. I just thought, you know, some of you out there might be going through this. You might really appreciate those. So I'll start to put them all up. There's probably 50 or so videos of all of that soldering and explaining and doing the venting, filling the system with the glycol, purging all the air. I have a lot of video of all that. So hopefully you're subscribed. Uh, if you're not, consider subscribing. Helps me, uh, makes, lets me know that you guys enjoy this stuff and, uh, you know, leave me a comment. Let me know. Do you, do you like these videos? Uh, am I wasting my time? <laughs> you know, so, but uh, yeah, I'll end this one here for now, guys. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Hopefully you got something out of it. Thanks.